Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to speak. Um, so what I'm going to be uh, presenting is work by Sude Gorbani, who uh, was my PhD student until about six months ago. She graduated and is now a postdoc at Wisconsin. Um, and this work, there was an early version in Hotnets uh, 2015, and now this is going to be appearing in SIGCOM later this year. Um, okay. So, um, as we you know, just uh, learned from the past talk, data centers have to provide very high capacity, and they do. We have a lot of good topologies for that now. Of course, we always have to be continuing to stay ahead of the uh, rapidly bending curve. Um, but for the topologies we have, we also want to use the capacity within them efficiently, which today um, is not uh, reaching what you might think it should. So in particular, as utilization increases, you can start getting significant packet loss events even well before you reach 100% utilization, right? Maybe even around 25%. So this is commonly a data center network might be run at much less than 100% utilization uh, for this kind of reason, that you have to account for not only traffic variation across time in terms of average demand, but also the fact that you get bursts, microbursts. Um, so the gap here um, is that we have high bandwidth provided via massive multipathing in the data center. Um, and it seems like it's pretty difficult to actually balance load optimally along those paths. And if the load is in balance, then of course we're effectively wasting capacity that's there uh, because we have to plan for extra capacity so that a, you know, uh, an un unbalanced uh, spike on one of those paths um, is, is accommodated by the extra capacity rather than by equalizing uh, the use of the paths that we do have. Okay. So, you know, uh, it might be a little bit frustrating. It seems that uh, even when we have that much spare capacity, um, that we have congestion events. And of course, the response has been that there's been a lot of research effort along these lines of um, how do we optimize load balancing in the data center. Um, and, you know, seemingly it, we have a lot going for us in this problem space, right? Because it's a very uh, typically very structured physical topology, you know, tightly organized so the latency is low. Um, Often it's a symmetric topology, not always, but often. So still, though, it's been pretty hard to do. And we can look at that um, kind of drawing a picture here of the design space along two axes. One is what's the control loop latency? So as you're maybe observing the traffic matrix, um, the traffic matrix being the you know, current set of uh, demands for end-to-end -end flow. As we observe that, we want to maybe react and reroute, rebalance traffic somehow. And so we're going to be doing that for, with some control loop of latency. And then another axis of differentiation along these schemes is what's the atom that you move around, right? Is it an elephant flow? where you're only going to be moving large, chunky flows because it takes you some time to react. Uh, so you're not going to worry about the little ones. They'll, they'll maybe use some less optimal scheme that doesn't get dynamically rebalanced. Or flow. Um, this example would be ECMP, right, where you hash a flow, all of whose traffic will be follow the same path, so one atomic unit. Um, flowlets, flow cells, and then you could imagine packets. So there's a number of different um, schemes that fall into this space and you can map them out. And all the way on the right there in terms of control loop latency are oblivious routing schemes, meaning that they don't adapt to the traffic pattern. Okay, 
So looking at this here, we can see that there's, uh, there's kind of a barrier to load balancing granularity, not falling below the flow cell or flowlet. And many of you probably have in mind why that is, but we'll talk about it. Um, there's also another barrier to control loop latency, where uh, we really can't react at sub-millisecond time scales, especially if we were doing some sort of global coordination, where we have to transmit data to a central place, do some sort of interesting computation, you know, send instructions back. Um, that's, that can be a difficult thing to do. Uh, Godfrey, I think Conga is not falling on this uh, limit, because Conga relies on piggybacking the traffic. It can happen faster than one millisecond. My understanding was that they react um, in several RTTs, time scale, um, in order to decide which paths to use. But yeah, they do have among the fastest control loops here for sure, because they're not using a central controller. Um, <coughs> and each, um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but it's a good thing to have in mind, so might as well talk about it now. In Conga, what happens is each um, uh, switch, the first switch, which receives data from the host, the first hop, monitors end-to-end -end paths to the destinations based on end-to-end um, -end data that it's transmitting, right? So piggybacking, basically, measurements along with the transmitted data. So it can get from the data it directly sees some idea of what's happening on the, on the distinct paths and uh, react to that. Right now, still, you're going to be collecting statistics over some period of time. So generally, it's going to not be just a single RTT. It's going to be more than that, and then it has to do a little bit of computation. Um, so you know, possibly you could slide that slightly to the left, um, but uh, it's going to be around there. I, th I thought that that's uh, what they reported. OK, so um, the problem is that microbursts do occur. And they're happening at much faster time scales. Microbursts be meaning you have a bunch of packets that uh, were sent in a burst or, or kind of are converged together from multiple sources so that there is a very momentary spike of traffic on some interface somewhere in the network. So if that's happening, you know, one, two, three, four orders of magnitude faster than those other schemes, then they're going to have a hard time reacting to that. Right? Yes. Something's missing in the design space, I think, which is the buffer size. Because buffers let you smooth out things. So if buffers and switches are large enough, the microburst isn't the burst. It, it gets swallowed in the buffer and mm -hmm. it looks very tank. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true, yeah. So you can, you can increase buffer size to accommodate those bursts so that it's large enough that the slower schemes have time to react. But that's at the cost of latency, so it's not really yes. just... It's right. latency when the buffer is full. The buffer is empty. Well, yeah, but you put it there because it's not useful, right? So are there any measurements of any option that shows that there are these micro bursts in data centers? There are some measurements, uh, which I don't have in this talk, but we uh, cite in the paper. Um, but one example is, well, I guess we do sort of have that, which is uh, TCP in-cast is an example of uh, flows converging on very small time scales. Um, right, so th that, thank you for those uh, comments. Uh, there's definitely that trade-off that we can increase buffer size to smooth things out so that you know, the packets wait for the reaction, um, but then you're increasing latency, and so we'd end-to-end uh, -end latency, we'd rather not do that because queuing is the major source of uh, delay in the data center network, not propagation, of course. OK, so we've got a gap there. And uh, the whole question of this paper really is, is there uh, something in this, this happy space here that is very fast control loop latency and can react at very small granularity, which is basically per packet is going to be the smallest that it's that we can go. So that's what we're proposing. We call this micro load balancing. 
because it's making very small per packet decisions. It's doing it on microsecond time scales, and it's going to be microscopic, local to the switch, in other words. So, it's, so the load balancing decisions we make, um, as you'll see primarily, are um, happening only local to the switch. It can make its own decisions. OK? Now, per packet decisions, meaning flows may get split up along many paths. The first packet of flow goes there, the next one goes over there, the next one goes over there. Um, up there, maybe only if we're using a uh, 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 data center design with uh, bouncing light off the ceiling. OK, that's a digression. Um, so you may get up in arms about uh, you know, the fact that we really should not be splitting up flows. Right? This is a commandment almost in networking, that you cannot do that. You seem to be angry enough to have lost a year there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what happened to that. <laughs> um, because, of course, if you split flows, then you reorder packets, and therefore you get throughput degradation, at least for TCP. Um, not for some other applications. It's not such a big issue. I'm sorry? It's not such, such, a, such a big issue. The, the Linux stack is actually fairly robust. Good. So um, this is true, yes. Um, but this is the, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the way that the community generally thinks. And that's why there's the concept of, you know, flowlets. That's why that concept exists, to avoid reordering. Okay. And also, you shouldn't make local decisions because you might, you know, uh, encounter asymmetry or instability if you're not aware of what's happening globally. Okay. So. We're going to get to that. I just wanted to acknowledge that there's that big question that's out there. Um, but let's talk about some intuition for this problem space, okay? for how we might be able to get towards what we call micro load balancing. And I'm going to start with um, a, just a toy hypothetical scheme called equal split fluid. Okay? So I'm making this up. And this is in a fluid model. Forget about packets. Data that comes in is, is water. It's colored water, depending on the destination, I guess. But it's, it's just water. And what happens with equal split fluid in a symmetric close data center, which I'm going to be assuming for most of this, um, what happens is as you get flow in, so consider this switch there. It's getting flow from its uh, you know, directly attached hosts. All of that flow it will simply equally split among all outgoing paths. Okay? Send them to, in this, partic this simple leaf spine topology, send them to the spines. Okay? Um, just an exact split, no decisions there. Now, if we look at the perspective of one spine, what does it receive if everyone is doing that? it receives one nth fraction of all traffic. Exactly, because we're in a fluid model. So it's exact, not average. But we'll come to that, yes. Because this is a fluid model, it actually receives exactly one nth of every end-to-end -end flow. Okay? The result being, um, and any two end-to-end -end paths, and I could have drawn this out, but each of those spines is exactly equivalent. They're receiving the same exact demands. So if you look at um, a path like up here and maybe this going in the um, other direction down here, um, compare it to going through a, a second spine, those two paths are going to have the same load exactly at every hop. In fact, they'll have the same mix of traffic at the corresponding hops. Does that make sense? So what this is saying is that this, and I just want to go through that carefully. It's a pretty simple idea. If you are familiar with the concept of valiant load balancing, the way it works is essentially this. All that's saying is that I want to point out that this is sort of the ideal. This is what we're going for. Any traffic matrix is exactly optimally load balanced with this scheme. Nothing more to it. What if you take one of those links and drop them? Like the the yeah, we'll come to that too. But for it, right now, it's symmetric. Okay, so 
um, we can think about the design space of a number of the schemes, not, not all, but in this way. We've got the optimal, which is equal split fluid. Now we can think of ECMP as an attempt to realize that in practice with some error. Where does the error come from? Well, it's not a fluid, right? Um, the granularity is uh, pretty large sometimes. It's a flow. A flow can be huge, OK? Um, and instead of equally splitting, it's pseudo-randomly splitting. Now, on average, thank you for bringing up the average, its average behavior is going to be exactly the same as ESF in terms of you know, the uh, expected volume on every link. But if you look at any moment in time, it could be kind of far off for those two reasons. So what could we do to improve that? How could we move, you know, have a better approximation to ESF than ECMP? Packet level. Packet level. OK. That's what you were going to say. OK. So we can do that. OK. And actually, I'll introduce another one uh, a little before that. Presto, which I cited earlier. Um, what it does is it, gets a, it doesn't go down to packet level. It goes to what it calls flow cells. Um, and it um, uses round robin, actually, I believe, to send these flow cells across all of the paths. Okay? So I shouldn't have said pseudo random. Um, it uses round robin from the host, but the timing differences mean that it'll end up kind of mixing anyway. Okay, the next thing we could do is we could say um, what you two both proposed, which is let's shrink the granularity to a single packet, but still operate pseudo-randomly. You could do permutation, yep. I could add that, that next one there. Um, so I could have filled in more points on this, this curve here, or this, uh, this line. But what Drill is going to do is it's going to use single packet granularity, but it's going to be load aware locally to the port. So remember, we're trying to reach this ideal of an equal split along all outgoing ports. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the current load as we're sending traffic. And instead of doing um, round robin or uh, random, we're going to try to fit packets in so that we get this ideal split, which means basically just sending them on the, uh, the outgoing ports with least uh, utilization with the shortest queues. Okay, so this is some intuition that we're what we're really going for. What a, a lot of these schemes in this space are going for, just to be honest about it, is we're trying to approximate this and we're trying to do it closer and closer. Yes. Well, somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago, we looked at this problem before data centers existed. Mm -hmm. and came up with a scheme that we called prioritized dispersal. The idea was that in your terminology, you would take a bunch of packets and indeed send them over different paths, one way or another, mm -hmm. but compute over them a few redundant packets, like erasure correcting codes, and then send those as well mm -hmm. with lower priority. Mm -hmm. So that whenever they compete with normal traffic, they use in order not to create mm. extra load. Yep. And this came to address another problem, which is when you have multiple paths, Assuming you need all of them, the delay will be the worst of all. Yes. By doing what we did, we have mm -hmm. some slack. The first k out of k plus r mm -hmm. arrive, we're done. Yep. And to solve the extra traffic we're creating, we sent the extra one with low priority. So that when they compete in queues, buffers, links, with regular traffic, they do. So it's like a and who did the coding in that case? Pardon? Who did the coding and de co oh, encoding and decoding? The sender, the sending entity. The host, uh, or was it in hardware in the? It, 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 was, it was in the context then. Remember, no data centers. It was yeah. The context of say why the area network. Okay. With multiple paths between the yeah. and destination. Yeah. So somewhere at the up. So I'm totally a fan of that approach, um, and yeah. So with that, you may improve latency because you get to take the shortest or. The, the, once you've reached the first k arrivals, then you're done. You don't. Have, you can. You can cut off the tail of the distribution. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
in this context, were you know working within, tr trying to stay within uh, a pretty uh, realm that's pretty similar to current data center architectures, where you know we're getting packets and we're not going to be able to do special coding on them. Yeah. So what traffic scenarios distinguish between number three and number four? Usually, there's a lot of packets. Mm -hmm. right, then you're very, very close in number three to your equals to three. Right. So and as the number of packets goes system. to infinity, you right. know the random split approaches. Yeah. Uh, it becomes a fluid. So when is yeah. the drill is is, um, is is significantly better or, or better than? than well. I, I mean, I don't know that there's a particular number that's a threshold, um, but we're observing, and I'll show some numbers of that, we're observing uh, improvement from that particular mechanism. So there's kind of two, you can view as there being two parts here, and both of them offer an improvement measurably. It depends on the number of packets, but also the number of packets depends on the number of paths you have. Yes. If you only have one yeah. path, one packet is enough. You have to after, you know, four packets will be pretty balanced. Yes. So I have a question. Um, well, wait, actually, let sorry. me follow up on that. Okay. If you have two paths and you have four packets and you split randomly, on mm -hmm. average, you'll have a pretty bad balance. Yeah, yeah so six yeah. packets would have eight You'd need no, hundreds. You need 100. Which, but if you're aware of load, then four is enough. So that's, that's, you know, a yeah. way to view the intuition here. Yeah. So, so my question is, uh, you know, coming out of ignorance more than, you know, uh, intellectual merit. Uh, that's the best it, place it, for it, questions. <laughs> it seems that, um, you know, the, the most intuitive way of, of, of doing scheduling, and if you, you know, have only packets, they're not related to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and all that you care is that you know you achieve perfect well balance just to go <coughs> exactly after the, the full board. So meaning if I completely disregard the, the, the mantras that you said that the you know the community has and just you know apply common sense, uh, then the, your, you know basically your solution w w would be the one that I would come up with probably. But there are all those mantras, right? That the, you know that you can't make local decisions and that yeah, you know right. you have to preserve flows. And so, mm -hmm. by and you're claiming that disregarding those is okay, essentially. Yes, yeah. but I have to show that. I have to right, show but, why. Right, but do you have so maybe you can you can you can provide an intuition before showing the numbers. Like, why do you think they were wrong or they are wrong today to start with? I will. Yes, that's a good question. So keep that in mind. Hold that thought, and we'll come back to that. Um, Okay, so what I just showed was the intuition in terms of sort of algorithmically what we're shooting for and how we're doing it. Let's get a little bit more concrete here, uh, and then we'll deal with some of the challenges, including that one of why it's okay to operate a packet granularity. Um, so how would this architecture work? First of all, what the fac fabric does, it will discover the topology, it will compute shortest paths, and we'll install them into the forwarding table. This is precisely what ECMP does. Okay, nothing different here. You run a routing protocol, you're picking a set of paths that are among the shortest. The only question now is how we're going to pick from among those paths when we go to actually send a packet out. Okay, so let's look inside a switch. To do that, packet comes in, it says the destination is A. We're going to figure out which ports are acceptable for A to go out, meaning that they're among you know, the shortest, uh, the ports that lead along the shortest paths. Okay, we will check among those ports the current queue occupancy, um, but we may not have time to check all of them and because we need to operate extremely quickly. So we're going to back off from that and say, well, what if we only have, uh, the hardware is only capable of giving us current loads from, say, two of those queues. We'll uh, randomly pick two of them compare the loads, and of the two that we pick, we'll send the packet to the outgoing queue that is shortest among those two that we sampled. Okay? Fairly simple. So what I'm referring to here, as you may be aware, is um, a technique called the power of two choices, which deals with this you know, model that comes up again and again of imagine we have some balls and we're throwing balls into bins. 
and we have n balls and n bins. If each ball is independently choosing um, where to be thrown into, and you do this randomly, um, then you get imbalance. You, you get some, some of the bins just randomly have more balls than the others. Okay, uh, and roughly with that uh, ratio there, there's going to be a factor of about log n greater load at some bins than others. Um, however, and that's a simulation of that process. Okay, uh, in the power of two choices, the balls come in sequentially in this classic model, one at a time. They pick two bins and go into the least loaded of those two bins. Okay, so it picks two, the next one picks two, the next one picks two, and so on. This actually brings the maximum imbalance down from log n to log log n. In other words, exponentially smaller, um, and that in practice looks like that. Uh, the maximum load in a bin as you're throwing in more and more balls with two choices. Okay, so this is almost... I'm sorry? That's true. Yes. That's correct. Okay, that's yes. True. It's not the worst case, but it's the expected value of the maximum over those n bins. Yeah. That's right. And also with high probability. Yes. Okay. Um, now I highlighted here sequentially uh, in the least loaded. Now what we want actually is we don't have bins; we have queues. And the balls are coming in on different ports, different interfaces. And they're going to make decisions simultaneously. So it's not sequential. So it's a little bit different. Okay? Um, and this may depend on the switch hardware, but we want the scheme to be able to let the switch do that if it wants to. Okay? And in this case, um, you know, so you have multiple uh, actors here that are simultaneously querying the bins uh, with no coordination. The problem is that they may all, and this isn't jumping out very much, but all these four may say, okay, actually I found the least loaded bin, I'm going to go there at the same time, and you know, now we have a problem. Okay? So, and then we have packet, packet loss. So there's this coordination because um, you know, as at the moment you're choosing a bin, that choice might be synchronized with the other um, balls that are arriving, okay, the other packets that are arriving. So as a result of this, if you actually run this process in the queuing system and vary the number of choices, D, that each arriving packet makes about outgoing queues, it doesn't look like the traditional balls and bins process. Um, it does improve. After you have one choice, you make a second choice. You, uh, you at least get to make a decision, right? But as you increase the number of choices, it then actually gets worse because of the synchronization issue. So I thought that you are talking about research published by uh, Dali and Kim and the uh, Abts and about high radix switches until you said that. So it really depends on the number of ports of the switch. Once you go to a large number of ports, this graph is looking a little different. So there is a very famous paper about adaptive routing, which is exactly what you are talking. And they, they invented a concept called greedy random selection, which is exactly the one that you described. And they show that with high radix, it's changing. Good. We, we should. I'll get that reference from you. Thank you. Um, OK, so just to compare that, uh, if this were actually a balls and bins process, the shape of that curve would look like that. So you would get better and better performance as you get more and more choices. That's not true here because of the synchronization. Did the number of ports or number of uh, ports you are, look, you are looking at ports? You compare the number of ones you're looking at. Yes, yeah. yeah. D is the number of ones. pick the same one. Yeah. yeah, but it depends on the total number that you have. Exactly. Yeah. Like, it's the Here I think it's 48. Yeah, this is a maximum. This is 48 port switch. Are you doing some sort of pipelining in the synchronization, or like uh, how are you? I mean, how synchronous are 
How synchronous are the arrivals? Well, um, I think this was a simulation with a stream of arrivals according to some because in a normal distribution. Decision, you probably have you know, all the packets in the pipeline and not be able to figure out what the decision uh, was taken by the packet beforehand. Right. But there's like, a, you know, the pipeline has a limited depth, I guess. So, yeah. you know, let's say you can be out by five or six. Um, yeah, something like that. I agree. Yeah, and exactly the shape of this curve will depend on the details of the hardware assumptions, but this general behavior will happen. Okay, so um, as a result of this, you need to set your parameters carefully, and you uh, need to reason about and prove stability, which Sude did. Um, but the scheme that we're going to end up using is two choices with memory. So there will be one choice from your previous round, which you'll remember, as well as one new choice that you add for every packet that comes in. Okay? So that's why we use a smaller number of choices rather than larger. Okay. So that's sort of the general basic scheme, um, which is pretty simple. Now we run into the issues. The first issue being this um, commandment that you should not split flows because if you split flows, you reorder, and therefore you get throughput degradation. Okay? And this could be a pretty bad situation because drill, in fact, splits flows along many, many paths. Implementing this, we looked at how many paths does a particular flow use. And um, uh, it's, you know, the average flow uses 97% of the possible paths. It, it's, it splits itself. So basically, every flow is getting split everywhere. And as a comparison, Presto is a little lower, but it, it's also splitting across paths um, within a flow because it uses those flow cells. And random if, is when you are, um, uh, it's not very specific, but per packet random, where every packet of the flow just is randomly sent along every possible path, not looking at load. Um, so it's basically the same as just randomly sending packet everywhere. In terms of pops, because the selection you make sometimes, depending on topology, can only be made for the first pop. Later, you have to follow the path. Again, that's on right. Yeah. So that's what's, right. what's the underlying topology? Um, so the experiments that we've done are within close topologies. So. The smaller ones would be a two-level, which is like a leaf spine architecture, um, like that little thing that I drew. Uh, we also have experience with, with three-level close, like a fat tree. Is made only in the first talk no. or also later? Well, as you get more and more depth of the, of the topology, you get more stages of choice. But if it's a leaf spine, then there's actually only choice at the first hop. Yeah. Once you've gone, if, you, if we go back to that, uh, that, just so everybody's on the same page with the point there. If we go back to one of these diagrams, packet comes in, you get to choose which spine you go through. Once you've done that, there's only one link that's on the shortest path to the destination. So you're actually only making a choice at one point in this topology, but if we add more layers, then there's another step of choice. So th th that scheme is working great even for four levels or whatever, and in many of these topologies, you actually have some choice going down also. So a quasi factory has provided you significant number of choices going down. So only at the max size factory, which nobody really builds, then you will actually have a single choice. You have no choice going down. So what was the size of the network that you created? Um, these, uh, in this, I, I don't uh, have the parameters offhand. But uh, generally, we've gone up to. Um, I th think the simulations in the paper are sort of uh, on the order of 50 switches, which would be um, hundreds of servers. So we've been doing this on 10,000 nodes cluster. No, hundreds is small. I mean, it's huge. You can, it scales. So the same theory, the same. Ah, the question is how do you simulate it? What are the yeah. tools that you are using ah, to see? We can talk about it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we do split along many paths, so we're potentially vulnerable. And actually, let's see, how much what is the uh, end time here? 
How are we doing on time? Yeah, probably in two minutes. Starting mm -hmm. ten minutes late. Five yeah. minutes. Okay. So um, with five minutes, I'll I'll go through it, and then we can take more questions at the end. Um, we split along many paths, but we actually don't cause much reordering. Let's look at empirically the amount of reordering. And um, random is fairly high. 0.24% of packets will arrive out of order. If you're just sending every packet along a random path, ignoring load. Presto um, does better. It uses a um, shim layer. I'm not going to go into that at the end host to, to fix the, the ordering. Um, but the point is here that even just working per packet, because we're load aware, actually the number of out of order packets falls to something that's quite small. So what's going on there? And we're not explicitly reordering. Is this coming from the memory in the JCMA? Part of it? Um, no. So you said you were uh, storing one of the batch hops that you kept and one new one? It should have been the reverse. Let's see. Um, good question. Didn't measure that. Yeah, didn't measure that. Um, but the other thing that's going on is this, this chain of implications here has another step. Splitting flows causes latency variance across the paths. And if you have latency variance across the paths, then you'll get reordering. So uh, the situation is, yes, the drill splits flows, but uh, it has very low queuing delay. So and very low queuing variance. So looking at, at that compared across those other schemes, it's you know, extremely small in the queuing variance across the paths. Hmm? Oh, the y-axis is it's the standard deviation of um, queuing delay, which, or no, queue length, I think number of packets, number of packets. Yeah. And then you basically sum it up end-to-end, -end, like how do you do that on that? Um, I think this is just sampling the queue lengths along um, one path versus the alternate paths. So if the same division is 300 for random, like what's the maximum queue length? I don't have that statistic offhand, but presumably it would be like fairly high. It seems numbers if it's just packets, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, good question. I'll have to check on the y-axis. OK. Uh, so the result of that, though, is that it causes little reordering. So that's kind of why that chain of implications happens. So basically, to summarize that intuition, the queuing delay variance is so small that it doesn't matter really what path the packet takes in a fully symmetric network, which leads us to the next slide, which is asymmetry. OK. So we are assuming in this work that the base topology is symmetric. Okay? And there's some ways to account for that, but base, the main thing we have in mind is we start with a symmetric network, but then there's some failures. Okay? Um, and obviously those failed paths are going to be removed. It's running a routing protocol. We're not going to you know, do something silly and send traffic along a path that doesn't work, but the network is now asymmetric. And that results in two problems. First of all, TCP has a problem with that because if you're splitting a single TCP flow along you know, this path and that path, um, it, the, the TCP is overall responding to the congestion that's sort of the worst of those. So, um, but it's still being split along both, so that's going to kind of sync the throughput on both of those paths. So you're going to waste some capacity of result. The other thing is, of course, uh, you're going to have different queuing along those two paths, so that's going to result in more reordering. OK, so uh, I'll try to go through this a little fast, but let's take a look at an example of that. So in this case, this link has failed. OK? Um, and I'm highlighting here flows that go from L0 to L1 and also from L3 to L1 in orange and green, respectively. OK, so is there any problem here with respect to our, uh, what we earlier needed, that the paths are symmetric? Right? So 
within the orange flow, all those two paths should be symmetric. Within the green flow, those two paths, those three paths should be symmetric. Does anybody see a problem? Yes. Yeah. That's right. So the orange flow doesn't have a problem because these two are still symmetric, but the green flow has a problem because when it sends traffic up here, it's now competing with orange there and there, but here it's not competing with orange. So uh, those three paths, one of them is going to be on average faster than the others. Yes, but you select by the load. So the load on that port is going to be lower than the load on the other. You, you do, but you, you select locally. Yeah, you don't see the, yeah. So the L3 is selecting locally here. Orange doesn't affect it here. So you only get, uh, you only realize that there's a problem too late. So the, the observation in, in all flow is that once you reach the core switches, there is no path diversity going down. So basically, that's right. drill cannot do anything with the core switches. It can only do stuff going up. That's right. Nothing happens about it. Not that's there. correct. Yep. That's right. And by then it's too late. So. That is a problem, OK? So the idea of what we do is a decomposition of the topology into symmetric subsets of paths, OK? And what each router actually does is it looks at the paths and ex explicitly computes which ones are symmetric based on the flow that will traverse them end to end, OK? And uh, because you care about all end-to-end -end flow, it doesn't matter the current traffic matrix. We're just saying which paths have the opportunity for similar versus different mixing. And keeping this short here, in this particular example, if we look just at the calculation that L3 is making when it sends to L1, this is how it splits those up. It says, ah, green, those two paths in green, those are actually symmetric. Orange is different. I'm still going to use all three paths. I'm still going to use them in the same average traffic volume. But I will only do load aware uh, splitting. Uh, excuse me. I will only do uh, splitting within flows within each component. Across components, I'm going to do something like ECMP. So there's a first step of I will hash flows, a third of the flows will go into orange, two thirds of the flows will go into green. Once you've picked your group, then you do the old drill that we saw in, until now within that group. So the result of all of this is as you have more and more failures in the network, you will gracefully degrade from load aware micro load balancing to ECMP. But you'll still say, stay symmetric. So. OK, so I should hurry up, I think. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say about the design. There's some evaluation. This was in simulation, uh, two and three stage close networks uh, using a real TCP implementation and a number of different workloads. I'm not going to go into the details now. I'm happy to share the paper later. But I'll show a few things. Uh, maybe actually we can go to the right to the three stage close network at 20% and 70% load in the network. Um, the, this is a CDF of the flow completion time. So TCP flow completion time, given what's happening in the queuing in the network, comparing across several schemes, ECMP, Conga, which is the, where the switches actually do this end-to-end -end monitoring, uh, Presto, which is random but at the flow cell granularity, so it's smaller granularity than ECMP, and then Drill. Uh, and we're seeing a substantial improvement in the, especially the tail of the distribution there. Um, similar thing with failures uh, in the network. And actually in this case, this is one where Presto, so Conga does okay when you have failures. That's one of the uh, strong suits of that scheme because it is doing end-to-end -end monitoring. It can dynamically adapt and shift traffic in response to those failures. Uh, Presto does not do that uh, because it's oblivious and it doesn't do this decomposition like Drill does. Um, so Drill does the decomposition and, and performs uh, somewhat better there. So uh, there's an even somewhat larger difference if we're talking about in-cast because this is a case where you have a microburst and there's a lot of traffic coming in from multiple sources that's converging. Um, of course, it may converge at the host 
which is what people often think about within CAST, but you can even get congestion earlier in the network as all of these flows are starting to come together at particular queues. And Drill is doing a very good job here of splitting up uh, that load as best it can among those queues. Um, the last thing I'll say is just we can look under the hood and see what's going on here. Um, and this is showing us which of those design decisions made a difference. So per packet VLB, this is uh, um, just each packet. It, the idea is there is valiant load balancing, but a simple idea. Every packet just goes down a random path. Okay. Sorry. Valiant load balancing means that you select another node and you send it through to that node, and that node returns it, and you pay half the bandwidth for that. That's yes. VLB. So I think we'll have yeah. to take further discussion now. Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, per packet random maybe would have been a better name for that. Um, per packet round robin, you're you know, sending packets uh, across the, striping them across the pack paths. That does a little better. Um, but what we're seeing here is the load awareness does help. Okay, so we haven't reached that regime where there's so many packets that they basically act like a fluid. They're still acting pretty discreet so that the, um, the probability of duplicate acts ultimately comes down rather significantly uh, through that load awareness. And crucially, this is keeping it nicely under the retransmit TCP's typical retransmission threshold parameter. OK. Another interesting thing is where is there benefit in the network? Um, and this is getting at the point that if you're in a uh, least spine topology, there's three hops. Okay, you, you start at the first switch, and there's a decision point. You go to the spine, there's no decision point. Um, but you may be affected by the mix of traffic that's already there. Then the spine goes to the destination leaf. And again, you may have queuing there, but um, at that point, then you're going on to the host. There's no decision. Okay, so. If we think about this in advance, we shouldn't see much of any difference at that last hop because it's the same traffic that's converging there going to the host. So there's no multiple paths to the host. So if we look at the mean queuing time at hop three, which is that last one, across all of these schemes, you can see it's basically the same. Okay. Where there is a difference is especially at the first hop, where you have a choice. That queuing delay comes down drastically. And to a certain extent, um, at the second hop, because we're effectively making those spines more equivalent to each other by doing good load balancing at the first hop. So that's kind of showing you under the hood what's going on. Um, so let me uh, just wrap up there. Um, key ideas being micro load balancing, we're making small decisions um, with a randomized but load aware algorithm along with this graph decomposition that handles asymmetry. Um, key results are stability and uh, provable throughput, which I didn't talk about today. And empirically, low flow completion time with what is ultimately a very simple switch design that's, uh, we believe, implementable in hardware. Uh, this is probably where the most interesting future questions lie uh, around some specific specifics of that that I won't go into. So let me stop now. Thank you.